So uh, this is a um, usual uh, Trustbit uh, learning and sharing session. So uh, we're spending 20, up to 20% of our time uh, learning and sharing to stay up to date within the company. And uh, except this time, the topic is quite interesting and we decided to uh, invite additional people uh, who are interested uh, in this uh, company activity. And today we would like to talk uh, a bit more about uh, the GPT-4, uh, not only as a hype tool, uh, but also as a new tool set uh, in the technical world uh, that is quite impactful and probably comparable to the uh, first industrial revolution. So uh, we'll go uh, through the introduction, uh, real world use cases, uh, history, uh, and dive into a tech stack of the project that is already uh, using GPT-4. And uh, today uh, with you are going to be uh, me, Renat Abdulin. Uh, I'm responsible for innovation and machine learning at Trustbit, just taking uh, machine learning products from idea to market. Uh, and uh, Aegis Gunafin, our uh, machine learning expert, uh, he has been handling uh, digitalization at scale from the 2017. So I guess, do you want to take over? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Aegis. Uh, I'm starting uh, in 2017, digitized my mother tongue, so that the language has a feature. And I will now give you a brief history of the ChatGPT uh, or GPT. Uh, in 2017, Google came up with transformers in the which attention was first applied. OpenAI used this idea to create GPT-1, which became the best in many computation. A year later, uh, using more data and using a large model, they realized GPT-2. The result of GPT-2 surprised many, as it could now write long linked text, and most importantly, it solved many new problems, even though it was not trained for this initiality. All future version of GPT use more data to learn and more parameters. This change uh, with version uh, GPT 3.5. Uh, it's essentially the same GPT 3, but the answers have been tricked to please people more. They hired people to do it and they marked which answers uh, they liked better. Uh, Chat GPT uh, here, they made the model work in dialogue mode and they made it available throughout the web UI. While there were no major difference from GPT 3.5, it allowed a lot of people to try the new technology. Uh, multimodality has been added to GPT 4. Uh, the model can now analyze both pictures and text and knowing the capabilities of cues, I expect that many tasks uh, such as text recognition, uh, picture analysis and others will be solved with a well-matched prompt. Uh, it's still hard to imagine how much this will change the world, uh, but it will uh, definitely be like the first industrial revolution. You muted, Renat. That's a common problem. <clears> Thank <throat> okay, I guess. Uh, so there has been a lot written uh, about GPT-4 uh, on the internet. Uh, there is white paper and there is model card, which uh, tells a lot. Uh, we wanted to uh, focus more about the uh, practical economic aspects uh, which can affect us as people working in the tech industry and being part of this world. And uh, there was already a lot of talk uh, speaking that AI will cause mass unemployment and uh, take uh, make people and companies run out of jobs. Uh, the biggest thing is that AI will not replace you. But somebody who is more productive with AI or some companies that are more productive with AI, they will be able to handle a lot more throughput and they might uh, be able to take more jobs and more projects. So uh, we'd like to break uh, impacts of uh, GPT-4 or similar language models because there are already uh, other implementations out there, not just the OpenAI implementation. Uh, it's split between the <coughs> personal productivity boots and uh, the high level economic impacts. And before we go uh, deeper into the personal and project, uh, let's talk about the uh, high level economic impacts. So on a huge high level, as I just mentioned, uh, this feels like uh, it's going to be an industrial revolution. Uh, what ChatGPT allows, uh, it allows new products uh, to be released much faster. 
Par uh, partially this stems from the fact that personal productivity boosts are immense. Uh, but it also uh, opens uh, new modes of operation. So uh, remember, uh, maybe like five years ago or four years ago, different banks, they started introducing chatbots. And these chatbots were supposed to be first line of uh, customer support and they felt uh, very stupid and very dumb. And the only one way to get out of them was like, hey bot, call human, you're not uh, working for me. Uh, and this project could have taken uh, years to accomplish. Now, it is uh, a single, uh, a small tiny team can implement much better uh, chatbot without much coding, simply because you have already a large language model that can uh, ingest uh, an additional corpus, be fine-tuned, and it can be done in a matter of uh, days or weeks or hours. Uh, uh, and based on the research that OpenAI has conducted, and they have done their due diligence for uh, eight months, so actually for the last uh, GPT-4 that was recently released and it made all the waves, it was ready eight months ago, but they spent uh, eight months uh, trying to make it uh, hallucinate less, to be uh, more precise, to be less potentially harmful or uh, more secure. Uh, and while doing that, they cooperated a lot with the uh, different institutions trying to uh, figure out what would be the outcomes. So uh, better, more personalized products, uh, it's uh, one aspect. Uh, if we're talking about the enterprises, and there is already examples uh, people are talking about that on the Hacker News, uh, there are companies uh, who are specializing in providing expert services in specific industry, especially uh, like legal advice or the companies that have been entrenched for years uh, because they only knew how to handle specific type of the compliance. Now these companies are uh, kind of starting to scramble really fast because a large language model can already uh, do a lot of things that they're already doing. And either their competitors are suddenly uh, be able to uh, handle more load, for example, in the legal industry, or uh, new companies starting to move in. Uh, and uh, the examples of workforce optimization are possible. Uh, it's They're happening everywhere. So for example, a uh, semi-automated language model uh, can go for the incoming customer requests and you can use it to uh, summarize the customer request and create new Jira tickets. Or you can go uh, ask it to go for the Jira tickets and suggest pull requests for the code base. It just works because uh, there was like an immense amount of training that went there and it kind of can navigate. It's stupid, but it can, can navigate human knowledge. And uh, the amazing part of the chat GPT-4, which people don't talk uh, a lot about, is that uh, research, OpenAI, they used uh, advancements in the AI to accelerate uh, the new model training even further. Uh, so they created a new model that allows to predict uh, which pra training parameters uh, which uh, could use uh, to train the model better, saving uh, thousands and thousands uh, of hours of training. And uh, large language model can already be used to uh, identify new uh, toxins or drugs or find new um, replacements. It can already uh, be used for stupid things like uh, here's the photo of my uh, website. Please create an HTML that uh, makes this website but make it look useful. I've done that myself and it works. And this actually means that uh, the speed of acceleration, the speed of new products, it is going only to increase. This has two bad impacts. Uh, first of all, uh, there'll be increased inequality, meaning that companies and people who have access already to the chat GPT they'll be able to use that to boost their efficiency, to boost their market reach, uh, to boost their productivity and uh, be able to gain more benefits. But less privileged companies, uh, countries and nations, uh, they will not be able to uh, gain as much uh, from these advancements. And this means that uh, existing companies uh, that already have access uh, to the technology or to the insights, they'll be able to entrench their position and kind of uh, strengthen their uh, place on the market. And uh, especially this will uh, apply to the companies that have access, for example, to the data sets, uh, to the know-how, to something that is can be used uh, to train uh, large language models. So uh, to summarize, uh, this new large language model, not only the chat GPT, uh, the four that was released by the OpenAI, there'll be, uh, there's even uh, more open models that, for example, the uh, model uh, that was released by the Facebook initially privately, but now it leaked on the Tensor, uh, on the not Tensor, uh, on the torrents, and you can uh, download the weights yourself. 
uh, there are different companies and the large mo uh, language models in general, they help to handle uh, new use cases. They make it very easy how to handle a case that were uh, very complex before, and they just open new opportunities. And next, we want to go deeper into that. Uh, let's start with how uh, it has already been uh, helping and assisting us in our daily lives at the personal productivity level. So, I guess. Yes, uh, we use uh, ChatGPT in the family on the fol following ways. Uh, I, no I now tell uh, bedtime stories to my children. Uh, the children make up the story uh, themselves, and ChatGPT uh, makes it up beautifully. Uh, in uh, at work, ChatGPT uh, has replaced the Google search engine. Uh, for example, I ask to write uh, code, and I can use that code with the first change. Uh, this saves uh, me a lot of time. So, uh, what was the example uh, when we were talking uh, when we were preparing for this webinar? Uh, like example of the code, we thought that it couldn't write, and then it wrote, and it uh, would have saved you like a couple of hours on the previous weekend. It was PyTorch something with the transformers, remember? Yes. Um, uh, for, uh, I, I made um, a sm smart speaker, and for this uh, task, for this product, I should create the intent uh, that should classificate the uh, user questions. Uh, for example, it is uh, he uh, asked me uh, the, uh, about weather, about uh, time, and another things. And uh, this code uh, I write uh, maybe one, maybe two days. And uh, after uh, the, uh, when this code was right, uh, I asked uh, ChatGPT, uh, uh, please uh, uh, write me the code with these uh, uh, arguments and this. Uh, 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 generate, uh, please uh, generate the train code and his uh, code and my code uh, was uh, very, very, very identical. So I should change uh, a, a lot of uh, a, a few uh, lines uh, to fix it. And so if, if, if I, mm -hmm. yes, if I use uh, ChatGPT, uh, I can save my one two days. Obviously, when using the large language models, you need to know what questions to ask. But when you are write them, when you have a specialist that can answer, ask them, uh, the language model is impressive. And even more impressive part is that uh, so ChatGPT the before the latest one, I think it has the knowledge cutoff of 2020 or 2021. So it doesn't. It wasn't trained on the latest uh, data on the latest uh, things that are available on the internet. So uh, when we were talking about the user intents and writing this code, uh, we had a question like, what if we ca can we use a new library? Uh, how would you use this a new library to split, I think, uh, incoming text uh, based on the sentences? Uh, and, we, and we asked uh, ChatGPT, said, no, I'm not aware of this library. So then Agis did uh, something funny. He just took, uh, went to the GitHub, he copied the description of this project, of this specific uh, library, and he copy pasted it into the ChatGPT, and then ChatGPT said, OK, so I wasn't aware of this uh, library uh, because I was trained before it showed up. But now here is how you can use this library to improve user intent analysis. And this is amazing because it came up with things that were, were, were plausible. And if you can copy it uh, like samples, uh, API definitions, it will even make use of that. Uh, and I've been using, uh, well, I used before uh, ChatGPT to uh, help me with a research uh, when we were talking about the coding to speed up the uh, refactoring boring code or simplifying the boring code. Uh, but there actually there is even a, a better alternative, uh, which is called uh, Microsoft uh, Copilot, GitHub Copilot. Uh, it's a more production ready. It's integrated into the uh, into, uh, development environments and uh, which is more important for the large enterprises. It is uh, license aware, meaning that if you're signing up as a member of a, a company, that is a very uh, has to be very careful about the intellectual property. Uh, with a, a co-pilot, uh, you can say yes, I must use only like the clear uh, copyright uh, sources, and it will make sure that this happens. And another important thing is that for the last months, 
uh, the rate of uh, technical advancements in this field, it was amazing. It's like, it's very fast. And uh, the products that we have right now, uh, they'll be uh, completely changed uh, maybe in a couple of months, maybe in a matter, matter of weeks, because the new uh, releases, new products, they just go and go and go and go. And things that I'm saying that, for example, with Copilot, you can uh, use enterprise subscription to create a uh, copyright uh, friendly code. Uh, chances are that in a couple of months, uh, Azure or somebody else will release a standalone container that you can install or uh, run on your uh, dematerialized zone. And it will uh, ensure that you're using only the clear data uh, or your company's data to create uh, any code snippets uh, that don't infringe on the any copyrights. So if you're working, uh, if your company is very sensitive about the uh, copyrights of the code that you're producing, like this has been already done. Uh, personally, I've been uh, using mostly uh, GP, uh, la new large language models, uh, not for the coding, uh, but for the thinking assistance. So uh, like when I'm as a human, I'm thinking about uh, designing a product or approaching a problem at a customer. Uh, I can, I'm single threaded, I have single core. I can think only about one line of thought and it takes like small jumps to get somewhere. Uh, however, uh, when I'm uh, in dialogue mode with ChatGPT, I can just uh, describe the situation uh, in abstract terms and say, what would be uh, the best solutions uh, or potential approaches to a problem uh, that account maybe for the constrained workforce capacity, uh, for the limited uh, access or for the peculiarities of the uh, development team or for this technological stack. And ChatGPT will be able to run essentially a parallel search on the very big definition, a very abstract definition of the problem, which is very human driven. Uh, and it will be able to come up with suggestions that factor multiple constraints of a project or a product at once. So this is uh, such a relief. This is uh, like speeds my thinking greatly because where previously I would need to sit down and think really, really hard for uh, a couple of hours to just bring multiple constraints uh, uh, into a solution. Here, I can just iterate, uh, use GPT as a crutch to help me iterate faster, to make uh, jumps faster, and basically to be able to achieve uh, more. And if we're talking about like less abstract ways, uh, the way large language models help, uh, when we're to, uh, like, I can ask uh, it, I can provide it with my journal uh, summaries of the work that I'm doing, and I can ask it to summarize the project state. I can ask it to suggest next steps. and. I don't mean that I'm going to use that exactly to as an answer, but it uh, it is like a rubber ducky. It helps to find missing angles or missing problems or missing benefits uh, that I would have missed myself. And it's uh, I don't need to try to schedule calls with multiple colleagues to get an additional pair of eyes. And the best part, because uh, large language models, they have uh, the background of the entire uh, encyclopedia of the entire human knowledge, uh, the, uh, like GPT and large language models, they act as a assistance assistants uh, that are versed in everything, starting from the uh, nuclear theory, cosmology, religion, history, and programming, and uh, all different skills. It, yes, it's junior, but it's assistant that doesn't get tired. It's an assistant that doesn't uh, get bored. It's an assistant whom I can ask. Please uh, write me, a, suggest me an outline of a pro, uh, like next project steps or next milestones using these this, this constraints. And it writes something. And I say, no, I don't like that. Please write it in this way. No, I don't like it. Please write it this way. Any human assistant uh, will quit probably after I said, no, it's junk uh, for 10 times. Now it just does, and it just does, 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 does that. And uh, probably uh, you have already heard uh, anecdotes on the internet, how people have been uh, using uh, GPT to a novel cases. So for example, there was one guy who said, uh, start a new GPT prompt and said, I have $100. Uh, I have this background, please help me make money legally. I'll do everything that you says. And he was tweeting uh, his journey uh, publicly and uh, being driven by the prompts that chat GPT was giving to him. So we reversed actually the control here. He uh, registered a website. Uh, he used Midjourney to create images, and he is now kind of in a business of uh, selling eco-friendly kitchen uh, something for the uh, for the for the kitchen, I believe. Uh, 
uh, and he's already profitable, not because uh, although he's selling so much, but like the niche is, feels nice. So he might, might be able to make profit, but because so many people said, hey, we want to invest to that, we want to invest into that. Uh, uh, different cases is like, uh, I've seen so many uh, stories of people uh, that need to integrate between multiple services. And these services like Stripe API, and I don't know, some lead generation API, or some uh, customer support API and newsletter API. And normally they would need to hire an expensive uh, consultant that would charge them, uh, I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars uh, to build a couple of microservices. Now they can just ask a large language model, hey, write me this integration. And as long as you uh, know how to check the quality of the outcome, you can achieve, uh, right, like get this, deliver a lot of these integrations in a couple of hours because it will just get the boring stuff out of the way. Uh, when uh, GPT 3.5 just showed up, uh, we has it as an exercise to see how it works. We asked it to write a kid's book uh, about magical creatures that uh, use uh, Python and learn programming to achieve goals in the, some fairy land. And it was writing coherent stories. Actually, uh, it worked uh, quite well that uh, my kids uh, were asking me at some point, please tell me uh, a new story about a ma uh, small fiery animal that lives in a volcano and his friends around the volcano, how he encountered the water elementals or how he lost a cauldron. And the even better part is that GPT-4, which is a larger model, uh, which has a larger context and that will be able to get um, images is so much better. Yes, it's dumb. Yes, it's, uh, it doesn't have creativity. But as long as there is a human in control, as long as it's uh, he or she or they set the plot, uh, set the constraints for the thinking, uh, it just works quite well. So as a person, uh, at the personal level, I'd say that uh, large language models make me a lot more productive uh, simply by uh, providing me with assistance that don't get tired, that don't get bored, and that can handle uh, mundane work. Like uh, this is the landing text landing page for the product. Uh, please create me the keywords. Uh, please create me a headline for the newsletter. Oh, uh, my, here's was another personal assistant, I think. Uh, I had a delivery by Obi that was delayed or stuck. Uh, and I just asked it, uh, GPT, please write an email to Obi that politely asks them when uh, the heck is my delivery. It wrote a polite for, uh, email letter, and people were saying that this is ChatGPT because in German you never write uh, letters that are that polite. But it did the, uh, did the job. Uh, so I've been talking, I've been rambling about the personal uh, productivity and a personal level. Like every person uh, who knows how to uh, ask their questions, they get suddenly a lot of assistance uh, that are specialized in uh, a lot of languages. So basically, you become the boss. Uh, let's go uh, one level, level higher and uh, let's talk about uh, how this affects actually projects in different fields. Uh, but before we go there, because it's a learning and sharing session, uh, is there anything you want to add or to question me at, the, at this point? Because I've been rambling on stuff. Yeah, maybe. Okay. That yeah, uh, yeah um, that I mentioned is that there are all the plugins for the Obsidian, where you can just generate text in your notes and maybe find some uh, relay relations between your notes. So there are already some some pretty useful stuff which can boost your productivity or the knowledge management, present knowledge management for you. Yeah, uh, it's amazing at that. So uh, I used to have my own general solution that helped me to switch context. Uh, basically, I, for each project on uh, which I'm working, I track uh, thoughts, ideas, next steps. And this helped to uh, jump the context when I, at some point, had to handle a dozen projects, I think, at a major international company. Uh, and now what I'm trying to do is, uh, and it actually helps, I'm just feeding this context uh, to a GPT model and it allows uh, to maybe answer some questions or provide summaries even if, without loading that context in my own memory. It's just such a relief. So for the knowledge management, uh, for uh, adding new corporate texts, uh, this is a great boost. 
And I think I just will mention uh, a little bit about that in the context of digitalization of entire culture and country language uh, later. Although I haven't tried the Obsidian plugin yet. Okay. I also have so, one uh, question, if that's fine. Yes, please. Um, so I've used it a little, a little bit myself, and uh, so the chat sometimes comes up with things that are not true. So uh, APIs that don't work like that, or uh, if I ask about a, pro a program, uh, menus are not there. Um, how do you think we will uh, think about in the future about truth? So when we generate knowledge from such systems, how do we know if those things are actually true? I'd say, um, first of all, uh, some things have already been improved. Chances are that you have been working with GPT 3.5. Uh, GPT 4 is much better. It hallucinates uh, much less. Uh, it still uh, is based uh, on the uh, old content that happened, uh, was generated before the Transformers uh, became public. Uh, so it will be, it will not be perfect, but as long as you have a, a hard data set to rely on or your own uh, gut feeling, uh, you'll be able to fact check. That's first thing. And the second, chances are that uh, companies will uh, find ways to fine tune it even further. Because uh, like, for example, how it is done <clears throat> in Aegis project or at Bing, uh, large language models, uh, they can uh, refer to the external body of knowledge while providing the answer. And you can also ask it to say, uh, please provide me with the validity score or the confidence, or please be laconic and uh, don't come up with something that you don't know. So it boils down actually to careful uh, prompt engineering. Uh, and with GPT-4, it, or even no, with GPT-3.5 Turbo, it's already, uh, you can uh, have three levels of uh, interaction with API. You have system level prompt, which uh, sets the scene. You have a user level prompts and there are uh, system answers. So there are multiple ways already to fine tune. And uh, so while there is no way to guarantee that the, a large language model uh, will never hallucinate, but there are already more and more tools that reduce the risks of that, or that uh, allow you to fact check or cross check. Worst story, worst case, uh, somebody will, will train a model that knows how to uh, detect hallucinations. In my own personal uh, cases, I haven't been encountering uh, situations where hallucinations were a problem, maybe because of the way I've been uh, asking questions. Okay, uh, let's move on to how uh, these new technologies, they affect projects. Previously, we talked about the personal productivity. Uh, let's go to the projects. Uh, so one project in which uh, we had uh, quite a bit of uh, experience in learning, uh, let's, for example, document recognition. An example of document recognition is uh, when, you, uh, when you're an American transport company and you have to work with the um, shipment documents uh, that uh, truck drivers or uh, cargo companies that want the cargo to be delivered, shipping manifests, they want to have it filled. And different companies will have maybe different formats and different forms. And uh, pre-large uh, language model era, when you wanted to automate uh, recognition of uh, forms, which are sometimes PDF, sometimes hand uh, written or hand printed out, so they're not precise, uh, you would need to gather a data set, a uh, sufficiently large one, uh, you would need to have a training pipeline uh, and you'd need to use uh, a mixture of uh, optical uh, character recognition like Tesseract with uh, custom form layouts uh, and have even more engineers to actually wrap it in a self-improving uh, pipeline. So that was uh, pre-GPT-4. Uh, now with GPT-4, what you can have is zero-shot uh, prompt engineering. Uh, basically just uh, provide the context just because there might be nuances saying that uh, this is uh, the company, this is type of the forms uh, and these are the type of fields that I have. Uh, please use this information to provide a JSON document that describes what is in that form. 
and GPT-4 with image uh, context uh, accounting, it will be able to provide that answer. Maybe it will not be pre precise, 100% proof, but you'll be able to set up this pipeline in 20 minutes, 15 minutes, because it's just tuning the prompt. And uh, obviously, if it's augmented with proper uh, models that are aware about the domain language, uh, aware about the prompt structure, then uh, you'll be able to have more robust solution, uh, but still in a smaller amount of time. Another classical example uh, that has been happening before, it's uh, if we're talking about image classification. So uh, let's say we have a product platform that uh, sells some uh, goods or products. Or uh, let's say uh, we're selling uh, clothes or, or no, uh, equipment. Previously, when somebody was uh, wanting wanted to list the stuff on the platform, they would need to have uh, their own image classification pipeline. Oh, so, sorry, the other customers would need to enter their image or product descriptions themselves. Like this is, uh, I'm selling a drill. And this is an automated drill. It doesn't have the slash hammer capability. This is blue. Uh, if you wanted to make this easier for the customers, uh, you'd uh, create automated uh, image classification, which involved gathering data set, uh, manually uh, labeling data, uh, using the training data set to actually create a model that uh, can uh, classify images. And then you still uh, need to have some pipeline to improve by uh, pipeline to handle new cases, new products. With GPT-4, with the uh, image uh, recognition capability, you get to the same story that you have zero shot prompt engineering. Just provide for the context, just provide with the samples, uh, shape uh, the context uh, through the system and uh, user inputs, which fit to the system. Uh, and it should handle uh, most of the cases within 20 minutes of playing with that. Uh, obviously, it is possible to fine tune even more. Obviously, it's possible to plug additional blocks. But the important part uh, in the old projects, in the like without the large language models, if you wanted to even try something like that, you would need a large team. You would need uh, maybe two, four, uh, or two, two to four at least uh, full time engineers. You would need a machine learning engineer. You need uh, MLOps guy. You need data scientists. Uh, you'd need to have uh, long research and development, and which is a pain. When you're working with the customers because shareholders they want to have feedback like is this working is it not working is this feasible is it not feasible uh, what's the accuracy so that would be a very long uh, investment uh, with large language models acting as a glue uh, it makes it much faster to prototype things like is something feasible is something possible and once you've uh, done this the research and uh, like just by just playing with the prompt engineering uh, then you can say, okay, it works, and maybe it already works good enough, and I can just continue the large language model on the premise or in the cloud. Uh, or, uh, yes, but I want this to be uh, fine tuned to my own purposes. So uh, I can add a couple of uh, models on top of that, or I can train a completely custom pipeline. So the important part is that you get uh, much faster feedback for the new projects that Sam felt unfeasible before. Uh, and another example, uh, which I mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, customer support. So uh, previously, there were chatbots. There were a little bit of automation of the customer support, and it felt stupid. Uh, you'd get uh, data sets. Uh, you'd get uh, intent analysis. Uh, you'd have some dialogue engines. Now, it's, uh, if you want to implement this now, you could probably get it done uh, in a couple of uh, hours. Just have zero-shot prompt engineering, uh, uh, especially with GPT-4 uh, 32 uh, kilobyte token uh, window have large context and plug it uh, into your Elasticsearch uh, and, uh, instance so that it can query for the previous uh, user stories or success stories or failures or customer support tickets. And this is a prototype uh, that given the access and resources can be set very fast. So long story short, previously uh, in the old way, uh, entry barriers uh, to, for implementing new projects uh, which are ML driven, they were qu quite high and they involved high capital expenditure. So uh, you'd need uh, people, you'd need resources, you need infrastructure, uh, you'd need expertise. And it's, it's hard to acquire sometimes, especially when uh, data scientists and ML engineers are a very scarce resource. And that's an investment. Now we're swifting uh, to a different uh, approach where to run ML during uh, scenarios in specific areas. Uh, you can start fast. 
uh, you don't have uh, such a capital expenditure upfront, uh, but you might have uh, high operating expenditures because uh, APIs, especially the GPT-4, they're quite expensive. But if you're in a situation where a uh, first mover in the market wins, uh, where you uh, can get entrenched, so this might be worth for fast prototyping and then uh, build a long-term solution if the product idea uh, works out. Uh, and uh, we can talk a bit more about the specific use cases that were pretty hard before, but at this point, do you have any questions or uh, comments or something that you wanted to ask? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask before, like, how expensive is it exactly to run a uh, chat GPT and like, what, what's the, what's like, what's feasible for going into production? I know that depends, but, but. Yeah, it depends. So uh, actually there are a lot of things to play with. So if we're talking about um, the stable, the most widely used, it's GPT 3.5 that does only text inference. So it's quite smart. It's uh, good enough to answer uh, plain questions. Uh, and for example, if you throw uh, $20 at it uh, using either uh, Azure, but you have to sign up for the API there, or using uh, OpenAI uh, uh, service, uh, then you can get uh, hours and hours of dialogue with it. Uh, if we're talking about the GPT-4, which is the magical one, especially for the large uh, windows, then uh, your questions uh, will uh, be very expensive. Uh, and I don't remember uh, exactly numbers uh, off the top of my head, but if I recall, like if uh, you can spend uh, a couple of dollars uh, with a couple of questions fairly easy. But the important part is that, uh, for example, uh, these models are just building blocks like Lego, and we'll show uh, a little bit more about that later, uh, which means that if you know that in certain cases, you have a question uh, that you can be used to, uh, like can go to a landing page, or this is a question to a high stakeholders. Like maybe uh, you want to summarize uh, the state of the company to executive uh, customers in a short sentence. Okay, then in that case, it might be worth using GPT-4. If we're just using a summarization of the uh, most frequent customer problems that showed up in your uh, web chats for the last couple of days, then uh, GPT-3.5 Turbo might be good. So long story short, uh, it is expensive. Uh, in the long term, it might be more profitable to wait uh, to get uh, open source or uh, publicly available um, models and host them on the premises on a cluster of uh, 800s or maybe dedicated software because there is already a llama. Uh, there are ways to run it. Uh, there is Alpaca, I think, which is a custom fine-tuned version of Llama. So there, uh, basically, if at some point you word it costs, there are multiple, multiple ways to mediate that problem. Renat, quick question. Yes, please. Uh, regarding a smart chatbot, did you use the embeddings to load your custom data into the such a smart, let's say, version of a chatbot? Or is it different ways how you load your own custom data? Uh, I guess we'll talk about that uh, in more detail later. There are okay. multiple ways to do that. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, and then uh, let's just <clears throat> uh, go briefly through a couple of uh, examples uh, where it's like which are possible right now, and some of them maybe were not even possible before. Uh, so, like if we're talking about the logistics areas. Uh, it's fairly easy as in, I can uh, imagine how to build a prototype in a couple of hours, uh, given the uh, proper data sets and structure, like uh, create a chatbot to help for sharing load details, ETAs, or any updates uh, with customers, reducing miscommunication and ensuring driver satisfaction. Or we can, uh, it's fairly easy to imagine a prototype uh, that can uh, take uh, scale out uh, transport managers in their communication with the tra transport drivers. Uh, but we can take it even further and we can uh, capture information, uh, things that communications between, for example, truck drivers and uh, the cargo managers in a specific specific chat, and then feed that for the summarization engine and the chat GPT to provide a summary uh, update. Okay, this is how truck drivers are uh, currently feeling, or this is the current set of the problems that I'm detecting. And these are the suggestions that I can do as large, large language model suggest to fix the problems that showed up today. Or this is how can I think 
that we can improve the company culture in this uh, kind of uh, direction. So things that required custom model training, custom pipelines, it's so easy to prototype them before because you have a huge large language model, which is like a glue or like, you know, like uh, what was the name of the kids putty, I think. It's a Play-Doh that you can uh, shape into anything. So you take a hard problem, you take a Play-Doh, you uh, plug it in another hard problem and just mold in and fill in the holes. And the best part, you don't need a lot of investment to try it out. Yes, uh, go give it a, a try. Uh, if we're talking about uh, smart uh, social media management, ad and marketing, so uh, I've seen uh, like if we're talking about how the new no, case of GPT-4, which can uh, ingest context from the images, it extracts embeddings and uses them uh, in the answer generation. So uh, let's imagine there is a, I don't know, a company that is focused on the marketing and they do a lot of events there. So uh, one way to approach that is to help them to build a new product is uh, they have a series of uh, photo shooting, of, I don't know, of some uh, null event and just feed them through their chat GPT-4, uh, add additionally a uh, branding style and branding description of this company and say, hey, these are the images from the event. This is how the company used to write about these events. Please write me a short narrative uh, here. Or, uh, this is a new image that I'm going to post today on the social media. Please uh, take into the context, uh, context previous successful uh, media tweets on this platform uh, that uh, produced a lot of feedback. Please address it to the demographic of, I don't know, 18-year-olds, uh, uh, boys that live in this uh, co uh, country and that like this uh, sport. And LLM will provide pretty good suggestions uh, for the copywriting. So it's quite good and uh, I've seen people do that. Uh, you can use uh, large language models to quickly go through the product catalogs uh, of like physical goods or of media goods uh, and to provide uh, metadata description, uh, better captions, uh, maybe descriptions that are aligned with the um, branding and uh, social image of the company. Uh, again, captioning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we're talking about the product platforms, so uh, now it's fairly easy or it's like feels like it's fairly easy to prototype uh, solutions like uh, let's go for the product image catalog and review if the product images are correct. Let's uh, create uh, descriptions that are tailored to a specific audience. So it's quite uh, previously, nobody would think of having a product catalog that have descriptions that are different for the young girls and young boys or uh, maybe toys that are di di uh, different for the uh, kids who are uh, interested, I don't know, in computers versus who are interested in sports. So it's just a matter of framing. Previously, such framing was not possible because nobody would invest time in that. Now, you just, just give the proper context to the LLM and batch uh, run the product catalog. But it can even do even more with the personalized suggestions. Because if we take a product history of personal shopping, if we take, uh, if they share their uh, background or interests, uh, if we know their demographics, just run that for the uh, large language model to provide a personal shopping suggestions for the person. Especially if you can th uh, throw in uh, maybe, what sort, uh, inventory surplus. So the things that the company wants to go on sale, uh, maybe the marketing budgets uh, of the company and maybe uh, additional photo inspirations that are trending around the world. It's just personalized glue that uh, provides uh, things that were not possible before. Uh, automatically fixing the uh, misconceptions in the like problems in the catalog, identifying uh, or if it's trying to identify, I don't know, issues in the satellite imagery or fixing the geofences. Previously, things like that would require custom development, custom pipelines, and now it's quite possible to prototype uh, automated solutions using large language models and then invest in the proper pipeline if it works and if the business likes that. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of caveats here. So first of all, uh, large language models, they work only with English. Uh, they work with other languages as well, uh, but they're not so good because like, for example, GPT-4 was trained using uh, English corpora, uh, which is like 65% of the uh, large language model. So. And because of the way tokens are being handled, 
if we're talking about the other languages, uh, they're much slower, more expensive, and not as good. But the good thing is that LLMs are just a building block. It's like a Lego piece that you can plug into different cases for uh, in different languages in the translators for more capabilities. And I guess because he was working with the uh, digitalization uh, at a scale for, I think it's like five or six years now. Uh, he's the best, best person to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, there is problem uh, of small peoples in the world. Uh, their language is uh, disappearing at a rapid rate. Uh, the internet where communication takes place in the language of numerous peoples is contributing to this, and the main content is also in this language. Uh, one of this language is my mother tongue, Bashkir. Uh, I have been uh, struggling with this since 2017, uh, trying different approaches, and I would like uh, to say that language models, uh, large language models, can be a tool which can save uh, such language. Uh, there are two problems why the younger generation doesn't want to learn uh, their native language. Uh, first, uh, little practice. Uh, when all the information of the internet is another language, and uh, when parents at, at work uh, all day and there is a little time to communicate with children, uh, children start communicating in the language they hear the most. And second, uh, if another language is spoken everywhere, the prestige of your language falls. Uh, that language beca becomes uh, second rate. So uh, people feel embarrassed, uh, embarrassed uh, to speak even if they know their own language. Uh, it used to be difficult to solve this pro problem. It required a lot of resources. Uh, nowadays, such problems can be solved by a few enthusiasts. Uh, I am currently working on a smart speaker in Bashkir. The main goal uh, is to boost uh, the prestige of the language, to explain to people that our language is no worse than other languages. And the most interesting thing here is that before only IT gigants such as Google, Amazon, and Apple uh, could make such uh, speakers. Now, Thanks to ChatGPT, it required uh, thousands of times few, uh, few resources. Uh, here's a schematic of how we have implemented it. Uh, two years ago, I built audio dataset with help of community, and then, uh, thanks to Trustbit, uh, I was able to train a model that could turn Bashkir speech to text. At the time, uh, at the same time, another activist was collecting parallel text and we have got over 2 million uh, parallel text. We are going to use it to improve the current machine translator. Uh, by analyzing what a user asks, we try to predict what to uh, the user intentions uh, and, uh, and send more information to ChatGPT with their question. In this way, we improve the quality of the answer. For example, if it is a Bashkir language teacher and she is getting ready for class, we can tell ChatGPT what topic they are studying. If the person asks where they can go on holiday by car, we can float on itinerary of known place in your region. Uh, once uh, the answer is received, we voice, uh, we voice uh, it th th throughout the speaker or send it to the person in the chat. Uh, I have been actively promoting the development of the smart speaker on social media, and I can already see how many people are interested in it, not only among my people, but also among other regions. Uh, and such a solution could easily to implement it other language. I have an, now uh, gathered a community of people who also have a language that are disappearing, and I'm helping them to talk uh, the path, the path I've already worked in uh, five to five years. Not so. Okay, uh, so uh, in other words, so, uh, I guess he's working on his own problem, uh, on his own kind of uh, passion of life. Uh, he uh, has been taking uh, the language, uh, which is not just the language, but also the culture, the context, the history. Uh, and finding a way how to capture this information in a digital kind of snapshot uh, that 
uh, allows uh, kids or uh, people who are interested in their own culture to preserve that culture. Because right now it's like English, uh, maybe Chinese and other major languages, uh, they just swallow the market share of the humans and the small languages, they just fizzle out. According to the United Nations report, I think there are uh, two to 3,000 endangered languages and half of these languages will no longer exist by uh, 2,100. Uh, but here, if since we're talking about the practical uh, aspects, uh, it is amazing how uh, previously the, even the notion, the concept of building your own Alexa or Siri that is intelligent, that can uh, integrate into the workflow, it was impossible. Only Google, uh, Apple or Microsoft could handle that. Although uh, Siri is quite stupid, if you uh, ask me. But now, uh, just uh, using uh, the heart of the system, which is uh, ChatGPT, and uh, gluing other existing models in, uh, one can uh, save pretty much the culture. It's like a model that is capable of answering culture specific questions. It will uh, reach out to different uh, models, uh, to different APIs, and it will work that. And obviously, if a solution, if a tool can uh, handle the cultural aspects, uh, then it's uh, also applicable to a much smaller smaller and simpler uh, problems, which are more formalized, like the industrial aspects, uh, industries, uh, automating workflows, automating uh, workflows even uh, in multiple languages as uh, for the international companies, just it works quite well and you don't, no longer need a large team. Of course, there are still nuances. You need to, like GPU resources. You need to uh, worry about uh, sometimes compliance, uh, personal data. Uh, you need to uh, figure out how to find resources, how to scale out the products. Uh, but if it's possible for the uh, hobby uh, projects uh, that don't have any external funding to build something like that, then imagine what a large company or uh, co-funded startup can achieve. So and this wasn't before wait. possible. May I interject yeah. with a quick question? So just to check if I understood it correctly, right? With this setup, um, I guess it, it already exists because I guess built it, right? So I could have a digital assistant like Alexa. I could ask it in the Bashki language, what should I cook for dinner? And it would find maybe even a meal that is appropriate for the region in which Bashki is, spoke, uh, is, is, uh, <coughs> is spoken. Would, and it would tell me because the text to speech would again answer in Bashki. It would answer in Bashki and give me a good meal recommendation for my evening. And I could build this. I guess much faster than the initial development that let's say Alexa was 10 years ago. Yes. The gotcha would be cool. is that uh, if we're talking about the uh, non-English languages, uh, the, uh, so for English, it just go uh, add existing whisper model for the speech to text translation uh, and uh, existing uh, text to speech synthesizer, maybe a uh, plug to Elastic or Solar, and it'll work out the box. As a server, you stray away from the English uh, common sense to uh, niche languages, niche domains, then more effort uh, you would need to invest. But it is feasible. So if we're talking about uh, the custom languages, uh, what's the word? Like different dialects. Uh, uh, or actually, even different dialects is the most fun because you need to gather the data set uh, of the for the speech to text uh, understanding. If we're talking about, for example, uh, you need to auto kind of plug create a soft api for international organization or have uh, which has people speaking in lots of languages and accents then you need to have a proper uh, data set uh, with the audio uh, which is uh, annotated semi-structured uh, some sometimes not structured and that would create uh, help you to create a speech to text engine then you'd need uh, also probably the translation engine if uh, or at least fine-tuned translation engine uh that because the best uh work of uh, large language models happens in english uh then you also need uh have professional audio recorded and uh model fine models fine tuned uh to get the text to speech engines but this is feasible this is a solvable task it has been done uh and uh if we're talking is doable So uh, do you have any additional questions, any concerns, any problems, uh, questions how to get it done in my next project uh, tomorrow?
what things I haven't, I should have told you, uh, which are not so bright and shiny, but I have hold. So the big question obviously is with all the disruptive things is does uh, or does society needs to get scared or is in a now and a new exciting time to be in? Both. Remember the Industrial Revolution. People who used to build uh, cars by hand or uh, that used uh, horses, they suddenly got out of the jobs because horses were no longer needed because you have automated cars. Uh, artisans, uh, they had quickly to kind of uh, that producing that were producing clothes or tools by hand. They had to start uh, learning different approaches to make money. So there will be changes and there will be uh, new possibilities. There will be like disruption. But the important part is that all, overall, through the industrial revolutions, through the like technological advancements, the well-being of the society it gets better and better. People get to live longer uh, on an average. Uh, except uh, like maybe for some groups of people, uh, for some professions, it will require more effort to transition to the new place. But on the average, uh, humanity will improve. Uh, and uh, for the like, I've been preparing for this uh, presentation uh, while learning or catching up on a lot of things that I've missed uh, for a couple of days, and uh, my mood was changing from oh holy or like wow i didn't know that this is possible or wow 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 it's like now uh my general sentiment is like wow so many opportunities so many things that uh, could be that were impossible before now uh are doable with little resources or with uh, without much investment so i'd say on average the summary it's we're living in pretty amazing times